Well, last week we started on the series, What's the Least I Can Believe and Still Be a Christian? A Guide to What Matters Most. And we shared that the author is not trying to be flippant, but it's based upon a story of a friend named Danny who moved from being an atheist to an agnostic and was ready then to make the leap of faith. But he wanted to know because he had been kind of burned through his years judgmental, intolerant Christians. So he said, what is the least I can believe and still be a Christian? And so the book tries to answer that question. I think you'll find this series helpful if you're looking for a faith that you can affirm and also defend. I think you'll find it helpful if you're somebody that doesn't like to check their brain at the door when you walk into the church. And I think you'll find it helpful if you have a skeptic in your life and you want to have a spiritual conversation with them about the faith. Today our passage that Amber just read comes from the Gospel of Mark. It, it has some teachings that Jesus shares in response to questions where he's challenged first by the Pharisees who ask a question about taxes. Then the Sadducees come along and they ask a question about what happens when you die and if you happen to be married to more than one person on this life on earth. Both questions were asked not for information, but to see if they could find a way to trip Jesus up. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were part of a religious and political elite centered in Jerusalem, the capital of the city. And they had this arrogance about anybody out in the country, in the area of Galilee especially. They saw Jesus as a country bumpkin. Matter of fact, they learned that he came from Nazareth. That didn't help at all. You know that Nazareth is not mentioned once in the Old Testament? And you'll find that every one of the gospel writers make the mention that Nazareth, a town in Galilee, because anybody outside of Palestine would have never even heard of Nazareth. So they're put out by this itinerant, poor teacher from a town nobody knows in Galilee. Who does he think he is? And they spent their entire lives studying. They were professionals in the study of the Torah law. They were the leaders of Israel's spiritual life. And now Jesus has come along to challenge their understandings. But then after listening to Jesus' wisdom, there seems to be one sincere person among the crowd. It says a scribe, which is a, another group. They were known as the, the, law, the lawyers of those days. They were the legal experts of the Torah law. So it wasn't just uh, secular law. It was about religious law as well. They knew the 613 commandments like the back of their hand. As a matter of fact, they even broke them down to 365 thou shalt nots, which represents one for every day of the year, and 268 thou shalts, which they said corresponded to the number of bones that are in your body, at least as they knew it then. Thus, the law was applied to all of one's times and all of one's movements. And the scribe asked the question, which commandment is the most important all? They loved to debate that question. And so he wanted to see what Jesus had to say because he had said things so well already. And Jesus' answer is not an original one. He pulls out the Jewish Shema, which comes from the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, and it's attributed to Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The Shema was a daily prayer that was the equivalent in Israel of our Lord's Prayer, just like we say every Sunday morning. The name Shema came from that Hebrew word for the first word of that, listen. It's translated from Shema. And they would combine that with other passages from the Torah, and it was prayed morning and evening. The Shema function is both the Jewish Pledge of Allegiance as well as a hymn of praise. So Jesus' answer was a good one, and the scribe received it well. And it's one that's worth pondering for ourselves. It was recited every day, twice a day, because these words need to become a part of us. They need to be memorized and reflected upon and prayed over because they suggest the Lord deserves everything from us. 
Now we could play a lot of word games with what each of these mean, but the thing that I found most helpful in my studies this week was the idea of strength. That's something I hadn't thought too much before. To love God with our strength. That means we're commanded to love God with the things that make us strong. It means we're to love God with our accomplishments, our influence, in all of our capacities. For me, that's a different way of thinking about God. Usually we tend to think about leaning into God when we're in times of need, right? That's when we turn to God. In the areas we feel strong, we tend to think we don't need God. This suggests just the opposite. So what if we focused on loving God with the things that we do really well? What are you good at? What is your strength? What do you have going for you? Is it money? Is it a great relationship? Are you good with people? What talents do you have? I mean, maybe the right now the greatest resource you have is the resource of time. Or maybe you're just a great host and you're good at hosting a party. We could use a few of those right now, don't you think? So if you want to live into the Shema, which Jesus reaffirmed as the greatest commandment, and calls us to love God with all of our strength, then start by making a list of the top ten things you have going for you. Can you do that this week? Just make a list. What's the top ten things going for you? I'm sure we all could do that pretty quickly. And then ask yourself, am I loving God with each one of these things? Do they point to Jesus? Are you using these gifts to bless someone besides you and your family? Ask the Holy Spirit to think of creative ways to put these strengths to work, to honor God and to bless others. So when all of our strength and might are used to love God, we will look more like Jesus. We will be obeying the command of Jesus to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So this thought, I think, leads as a nice segue to the second commandment. I wonder if Jesus might be speaking directly to his audience. Remember those Pharisees and Sadducees, they're still out there. And they need to hear this. They would have thought they got that first commandment down. And they followed those 613 Torah laws with great precision. They even got laws on how to follow the laws. And they got that down. They're fasting twice a week. They tithe. They follow those strict dietary laws, and they got all kinds of rules about how Sabbath work is supposed to be done and how you can't work on the Sabbath. All that's considered work and all that's considered not work. But Jesus wants them to know that's not enough. That's not the real spirit of the law. So he adds this second commandment. And he pulled it from another book of the Bible, Leviticus 19.18. It says, you must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against other people. Instead, you must love the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You see, those religious experts had so focused on their own self-righteousness, they lost the sight of God's love for others. If you love God, you got to love other people the way God loves them, right? The Pharisees and Sadducees needed to hear this because they were not living it. They weren't living it right at that very moment because they're out to get Jesus. Their actions are not led by love. So when I, I thought about this scene with that legal expert, you know, I couldn't help but laugh a little. I mean, here Jesus is answered so well with this beautiful Shema. And then he goes and complicates things by throwing in that thing about loving neighbor as ourselves. I mean, he ruined a great moment, right? You know, I've heard people say in retail, I would love my job if it wasn't for the people. You, have, have you ever said that? Sometimes I think that way in ministry. It's a great job being a pastor if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> Same way with our faith, right? Being a Christian would be easy if it wasn't that we had to love people. People let you down. Communication is so blasted hard. We all have different understandings about what's important. All of us bring a lot of unhealthy baggage from someplace 
and that gets in the way frequently. There's always going to be a messiness in trying to live out with those extra grace people in our lives. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Relationships are simply hard. And COVID has certainly exposed a lot of that. I, I've noticed the impact of COVID on a lot of relationships. That we first heard of this sign in China. Remember, China was the first country to lock down and also the first country to come out. And immediately we heard a trend that divorces in China had spiked up tremendously. And now we're seeing this is becoming a common experience all around the world. Divorce applications and breakups are skyrocketing around the world. A British law firm, Stewart's, logged a 122% increase in inquiries from July to October compared to the same time the previous year. Charity Citizens Advice reported a spike in searches for online advice on ending a relationship. In the U.S., a major legal contract creation site recently announced a 34% rise in the sales of its basic divorce agreement. And with newlyweds who had been married in the previous five months was 20% of those sales. Of course, this is probably just represent the cracks that were already in the relationship. Now, I'm pretty thankful for my COVID experience. I had a pretty good roommate, I have to say. We had a lot of things going for us. And, and anything that might test us, we had a big enough house, we could go find a different place to go if we needed it. But I got a real taste of the quarantine experience, at least some of these couples must have been having, when we just took our two-week vacation. We decided to drive to Yellowstone. And of course, that means you're in a car 24-7, right? No time apart. And that works out pretty well. As I said, Nancy's a good roommate. She's a good companion. She's my best friend. And that's all good well, except there's one area that we are not very compatible. And that is that I'm an early morning person, really way too early, to be honest, and Nancy is not. So I'm usually up every morning at 5.30, ready to go any place by 7 o'clock, and Nancy's up about 7, 7.30, maybe 8. And then she's got this two-hour routine that she's got to do every morning. A lot of it's a lot of self-care. It's good stuff. It's why she looks so young. But she's got to do that. So I knew that going into this vacation. So I just re resigned myself. I'll pull a book out or whatever. I'll find something to do and just sit back. When we go, we go. That usually meant we wouldn't be anywhere until 9, 30, 10. That was okay. Then there was just one morning where she had a couple other things she had to take care of with her business. And so that 9.30 or 10 became 11. And so I'm getting a little frustrated. You know, th this is nearing the end of our vacation, so we've got less flexibility. And uh, so I'm a little ticked that day. I I'm having to remind myself to love your neighbor as yourself. And then to make matters worse, we were in the mountains and so we lost GPS and I took a wrong turn. So now we're really way behind. And I, I have this agenda, the stuff I want to get done the next day. We want to get far enough down the road. We already had to knock something off it that we wanted to do. So it's pretty frustrating. And it's just a reminder that we have to choose to love our neighbor as ourselves. I, I can't help but think God helped me miss that turn just on purpose to make sure I humbled myself enough to realize I'm not perfect either. So to love another is a decision we've got to make over and over, day after day. And if you'll doze with me just a little bit more, I got one more application. I think this thing speaks to, especially the setting of this scene that speaks naturally to a challenge we're facing right now in our world. You know, when you read your Bible, you find out that the prophets and Jesus were frequently in the middle of the politics of their day. Many of the Old Testament prophets were advisors to or critics of the kings of Israel. It's mentioned over and over if you read your Old Testament. And right here in our story today, Jesus is confronted by two political parties of his day. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were religious political parties. 
And they thought they were working in the interest of God as they tried to bring Jesus down. But there's a flaw in their understanding of what matters most. They forgot the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Their attack on Jesus shows where their heart really is. And because they lost the spirit of the Torah law, their actions end up being used by the evil one, which ultimately sends Jesus to the cross. Do you hear that? Their intentions were not evil from the beginning. These are not your typical bad guys you see in the movie. They were the respected religious members of their society. People looked up to them. But because they failed to keep the love of God and of people as their guiding principles, their mission statement or their understanding is the greatest commandment, Jesus ends up being put to death. And don't we need to hear this today? Political polarization in our world, our country, on social media, and even within our churches needs to be tempered with the love of God and the love of people. Jesus' ethic of love is just as relevant now in our time as it was to those Pharisees and Sadducees. What happens if every conversation that we have begins with the ethic that you are a child of God and I'm a child of God and our relationships more important than any political belief, any philosophical ideal? What would happen in our conversations if we led with that? Perhaps it'd bring us closer together. Perhaps we'd find some creative solutions to all the problems we face in our world today. Maybe I'm naive, but I believe the church should be a safe place where we turn off the news media, where we stop the personal attacks, and we hear one another. My vision for Nobles of First is that it's a place where Republicans and Democrats can learn to live together, to hear one another, to respect one another. Church should not be a place to avoid politics, but it should be a place where our faith informs and helps us work out our politics. What a witness to our skeptical world if the church could model that kind of healthy dialogue. I mean, I know I've grown personally. I've learned so much because I've lived all my life in this big tent, United Methodist Church, which means I've experienced perspectives far different from me all through my life. And I've learned and I've grown. I've been challenged. I've been exposed to different perspectives. And I know that I never want to be in a place where everyone has to think alike. Diversity is a strength. But the only way that vision works, if we know what the greatest commandment is, if we lead with love, where we maintain Jesus' ethic to love God and love neighbor. We have to lead with that in everything we say and everything we do. So, if you're reading the book, know that as you think about what matters the most, the first thing has to be love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor and everything else will follow. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you instill this, especially in our challenging times. Help us to love the difficult people in our lives. Help us to love that person right next to us that we've got to uh, overlook some of the things that are different from us, and especially let us speak out and find that common ground in a world that's so polarized. We have a calling. Help us live into that, not be afraid of it. All this we ask in the name of your Son. Amen.